We are here with Mr. Sean Cleary. Sean, you're involved with several organizations. Could you tell us uh, about that first? Sure. In, uh, in business, our primary focus is in assessing and pricing risk, mainly for very large capital projects and outside of the OECD. There are two very curious things about investment in areas outside of the organization for, uh, for economic cooperation and development, the sort of 30 richest countries in the world. In all of the rest of the world, the levels of investment are actually extremely low as a percentage of the global total. But the returns on investment are extraordinarily high. In the Andean region of Latin America, Sub-Saharan Africa, the non-oil sectors in the Arab Middle East, large portions of Central and, and Southern Asia, and also in Northeast Asia, returns on foreign direct investment are usually above 25%, but each one of these regions only attracts about 2% of global FDI flows. Mm -hmm. So the real question is why is that? And the reason is because the Basel regime discourages highly rated banks from investing in these areas. Uh, they're not able to extend debt without providing very extensive provisions in respect of their own balance sheets. And insurers can't price risk properly because there isn't enough actuarial data to enable it. So we find on average that something like 5% is added in premium to the cost. And if you need to get a 15% hurdle rate, if you're an ordinary business investing in those areas, then you have to have a 25% real rate of return to cover it. So that's, broadly speaking, what we do in the business realm. The rest of my life is a function of teaching at business schools and at law schools uh, in the US, in Europe, and in South Africa, where, it's where I come from originally, and then spending a lot of time addressing what I call the big picture issues. And the big picture issues are the function of the fact that we've created a global economy, which is terribly exciting and creates enormous opportunities, but we do not mediate that economy with a global polity. We have no global polity, and we're not going to create one in my lifetime, and perhaps not even in yours, because of the fact that we don't have a sufficient agreement about the common norms and the common values that would underpin such a polity. Now, that means the opportunities are gigantic, but the risks are considerable. And the global financial crisis that we've all just been through in the course of the last few years is a good illustration of the way in which those risks manifest. Okay, so let's talk about globalization then and uh, the challenges it's posing for entrepreneurs and uh, humanity in general. Well, globalization scales the opportunities available to entrepreneurs. The wonderful thing about the end of geography, which is probably the best way of, of thinking about globalization, the wonderful thing about digitization, the creation of the World Wide Web and often internet backbone, is the fact that the startup cost for new entrepreneurial activity is much lower, and the scale of engagement with economies and consumers and suppliers around the world is much larger. So you can scale businesses much faster than it was possible to do in the past, and your geographic reach is much larger. So the opportunities are enormous. When we move sideways, though, and we start looking at the challenges to humanity, then it's that disaggregation that I was talking about before. The economic opportunities are huge, but very large numbers of people can't participate in those because they lack the skills, they lack the internet backbones, they lack the communications technologies, they lack access, if you will, to those things that define the so new there's economy. there's a divide right now. Huge, it's and the divide is widening. And then associated with that, because of the fact that we have tended to prioritize the opportunity for wealth and for advancement on a personal level over the last 30 years or so, we've perhaps lost a sense of community, a sense of obligation to society that used to characterize the attitudes of highly successful populations in, in, in past centuries. And the last thing, of course, is that we're pushing the limits in respect of the ecosystem within which we live, and we're causing problems in respect of water, in respect of uh, degradation of oceans, in respect of climate, in respect of a whole lot of other areas. We've got to find a way of getting back to a level of balance between individual rights and freedoms, which are absolutely essential for economic advancement and innovation, 
a sense of obligation to community, which is critical to maintain a degree of balance in our societies, and respect for the ecosystem on which we depend for our survival. So, so how important is um, cultivating communities to uh, entrepreneurship? Obviously, there. I, I, I think it's huge. I mean, I think entrepreneurs in the first place are salmon who swim against the stream. So entrepreneurs are people who have passion, who have an idea, who have commitment, who can stand up when they've been knocked over four times and keep going, who are capable of adapting to changing circumstances and capable of transforming the world. So in one sense, they stand outside of community. But in another sense, they are the empowerers of community. They are the ones, when they succeed, who create employment. They are the ones, when they succeed, who spread wealth. They are the ones who create renewal and innovation and transformation. And they, the entrepreneurial spirit is the only spirit that is, in fact, going to take us into a, a means of addressing the challenges of the new age. We can't rely on old business models. We can't rely on traditional ways of doing things. It's only out of the innovations and the transformations that come out of entrepreneurial activity that we can possibly address the challenges of the future. So your thoughts on the entrepreneurial landscape in the Arab world? Well, I guess the Arab world, if you went back to the period between the 9th and the 13th centuries of the Common Era, was actually a remarkably entrepreneurial place. Extraordinary knowledge economies, extraordinary diffusion of knowledge, experimentation of a scientific and technological uh, nature, uh, astronomy, uh, navigation, uh, botany, uh, enormous ranges, medicine, another outstanding area, clock making, irrigation, practically everything that you can think of that was happening in the world in that five, six hundred years was actually happening either in the Arab world or in the Islamic world or in China. Nothing very much was happening in the West at that particular period. So there is a level of propensity, a level of openness in a certain sense within the cultural tradition that is extraordinarily innovative and to a significant degree entrepreneurial. But for a considerable period of time that's been suppressed, it hasn't been evident, it hasn't been apparent. And hierarchical structures, authoritarian structures have come to characterize the political landscape to a significant degree until perhaps about 10 years ago. The last 10 years, we're beginning to see something of a resurgence of opportunity yes. in terms of individualism, entrepreneurialism, innovation, uh, in inquiry, research, development, all of the things that make for excitement in terms of knowledge societies. What is the key thing that needs to be done to you know, make sure this thing is pushed forward in the region? Well, people have to develop a sense that their future uh, lies in their hands. It doesn't lie in somebody else's hands. It doesn't lie in the government's hands. It doesn't lie in Western multinationals' hands. It doesn't lie in Chinese hands. It doesn't lie in the hands of the largest companies in this region. It lies in individuals' hands. Right now, the 16% unemployment throughout the Arab world, 80% of that is within youth ranks. Uh, the number of 50 million new jobs in the next decade is often thrown around. Though those jobs can't come from anywhere else except entrepreneurial activity. Most new employment everywhere in the world in the last 60 years has come out of companies with less than 500 employees. Wow. Do you know that, I mean, we've done research in the Arab world, uh, just above 50% of the Arab youth wish to have government jobs. So it's actually having to go into the schools at a very young age and changing that mindset that I think that is the probably no, the I toughest. Think that's, I, I think know. that's absolutely right. I, I think what one's got to actually get to is in a very real sense a, a renaissance. We, we often think about the rise of the West in the period from the late 1400s up to perhaps around about, around about 1980, 1990 perhaps. That whole period was started by a rediscovery of systems which derived from Greece and from Rome, mm -hmm. which had actually been immensely successful and then went into decline. Mm -hmm. Now, what I'm suggesting is that the systems between the 9th century and the 13th century of the Common Era were in fact systems in which the Islamic world excelled 
to a degree that is almost unprecedented in terms of human history. If that cultural heritage, if that recognition of something that actually lies in the cultural tradition can be rediscovered, then in exactly the same way that we moved from an Italian Renaissance that led us to an age of reason, an age of enlightenment, an industrial revolution, we can see a similar transformation into a new world in this part of the world. Yeah, well, I hope this is, uh, and many events like this are the start of such a, a journey. Uh, well, the branch is doing something quite yes. remarkable in yeah. respect to bringing this about, and I think the response that we can see all around us is evidence that the time is right and people are enthusiastic. I think so. I think so. Mr. Sean, thank you so much for talking with us. Thanks so much.